ただいま Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the kind introduction. My name is Sato with Ocean Research Institute of University of Tokyo. This is the theme which I would like to discuss before you today. In researching wild animals, direct observation is a very basic method we all employ. However, aquatic animals like the one you see in front of you are very difficult to observe with our eyes when they submerge underwater. Uh, they are beyond the reach of our visibility. Uh, one of the ways to make the invisible visible uh, is the biologger, which uh, we have been using for our studies. Uh, the very first uh, animal I'd like to share with you today is uh, strict shearwaters. About 30 years ago, in Kamurujima Island of Kyoto, uh, this uh, uh, bird was studied and the research findings were published in the form of such a book. Internationally, Attenborough um, uh, used uh, movies and books uh, on this um, species. And this uh, book uh, shows that this bird is a, a tree climber. And uh, as a result, uh, many people began uh, to believe mistakenly uh, that this bird had to climb a tree to take off. But that is not the case, uh, though it was aired on NHK program. And it was mentioned that uh, it had to climb up a tree uh, to uh, do a takeoff. But as far as I have observed, 99% of the individuals are able to take off from uh, the land surface. In certain cases, uh, those birds are able to uh, take off from the ground without any approach to run. And so they do have the capability to have a takeoff without climbing trees. And so we could observe how uh, they were able to achieve uh, the takeoff. But after the takeoff, we were not able to observe uh, what were the specific uh, flight behaviors. And so I decided to attach such a accelerometer at the abdomen of the tree uh, to observe uh, their flight behaviors. Uh, with uh, a lot of uh, soundings, we are able to get uh, the time series data for acceleration. Uh, and also, uh, we uh, provided uh, the wavelet uh, transformation for fluid analysis. And we were able to get 10 different uh, spectrums. Uh, what uh, caught my attention uh, is this. Uh, that is a 7.5 hertz uh, wing flapping frequency uh, they use for takeoff. And another is uh, this lower frequency uh, used during the flights uh, they had to use in order to sustain their flight. Uh, sometimes uh, they uh, have to do a sporadic uh, wing flapping, and around on that purpose, they use this uh, lower uh, frequency. And also, this takeoff here uh, means not only the land takeoff from the land, but also from the water surface. Uh, when they came down to the water surface for foraging, they had to take off from the water surface. Uh, but if uh, this uh, bird was too weak uh, to have a direct takeoff from the land, uh, this uh, individual would never be able to take off from uh, the water surface. But that is not really the case at all. And so it has been all wrong that uh, they were not able to have a direct takeoff uh, without um, uh, tree climbing. Now, uh, let me show you this, uh, the big one, a wandering albatross. Uh, wild uh, animal, uh, the largest uh, bird, uh, three meter uh, for wingspan and uh, weighs 10 kilograms. And we got our acceleration data uh, from a date logger, and we were able to get such a flapping frequency. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we take a body mass. On the vertical axis, wing flapping frequency. Five different bird species. I took two or three individuals for each species, and each species had two different frequencies. One is the lead one, the higher frequency, and those are the frequencies used for a takeoff for any species. And perhaps this higher frequency is limited by a muscle force of the individual. Uh, and the blue line or dots indicate. Uh, the lower frequency used for the sporadic uh, flapping. Uh, those uh, birds are good at the gliding, but actually uh, they are not able to sustain their flight uh, always. 
uh, through the gliding. So in order to sustain their flight, sometimes they have to do a sporadic flighting in order to sustain uh, the enough uh, speed for sustainable flight. And what is interesting are on the dotted lines, uh, two lines meet with each other, meet with each other at the uh, point, uh, which indicates body mass 41 kilograms and wingspan 5 meters. This means uh, this is the frequency required in order to uh, sustain flight. Uh, but if uh, the animal is bigger uh, than this, uh, then uh, that animal or bird is not able to sustain or cannot uh, uh, fly. Uh, this gave rise to a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, this is uh, uh, a pterosaur which went extinct. And one of the species is called uh, Quetzalcoatlus, the largest uh, tenosaur, a 10 meter wingspan, and uh, it is estimated that it had a uh, 70 kilograms of body weight. And as you can uh, notice, uh, this means that uh, this uh, uh, tenosaur was too bigger. Uh, much bigger than the threshold value I showed earlier. So uh, this couldn't perhaps fly at all uh, under the current global environment. But if suppose what were the environmental conditions which would allow the tenosaur like this to fly, uh, one would be a different gravity. Uh, But at the moment, there is no phenomena or mechanism that will be able to considerably change the gravity acceleration than the one we have today. And another parameter which could be manipulated, uh, uh, air density. Uh, and it could be uh, possible that air density was higher uh, than the air density today uh, back in those ancient days by several times. Um, so if uh, that was the case, then perhaps such a big uh, bird was able to fly in the ancient uh, climate. Of course, uh, there is no uh, conclusion I can draw on for this question uh, right now, uh, but um, uh, uh, from the work uh, by uh, Dr. Takahashi, who is going to speak right after me, uh, captured such an image. And that is the bird's eye view, a black browed albatross's eye view over the scene, taken from a dead lover. And you can see this uh, killer whale. And in the past, we were able to capture uh, that those uh, albatrosses' uh, uh, feces included remnants of deep sea animals. <coughs> and we were wondering how they were able to capture such a deep water animals uh, to uh, feed on. And we were able to understand from this image that, that they were chasing after a killer whale and were able to feed on uh, the leftover food like the deep water animals from the killer whale. And this is a uh, uh, work we did in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Takahashi uh, of uh, the National uh, Polar Research Institute and uh, uh, Mr. Francis Dawn from Scotland, Edinburgh. And this is uh, the data logger uh, we used, and this is a European shack. Uh, this uh, uh, bird uh, dives uh, to, uh, for foraging in a rocky uh, habitat like this. Um, it uh, uh, captures a butterfish like this uh, and uh, uh, goes up uh, to the water surface. And such a uh, uh, big butterfish, uh, they do not uh, uh, swallow it down right away, uh, but uh, it um, uh, captured uh, the butterfish uh, with with uh, uh, bill and then uh, move up uh, to the water surface, and this is a, a, a flat fish uh, going up to the water surface after the shark caught uh, the flat fish at the bottom of the water, and uh, also sandy habitat is another habitat where they uh, do the foraging. Uh, this um, a bird is now poking uh, the bill into the sandy uh, uh, floor trying to capture something, but the 
image quality wasn't good enough back in those days, so we were not sure what it was trying to capture. But now uh, the technology improved, and we were able to see that it was uh, uh, foraging on a lesser sand eels. And so in sandy uh, habitat, there was one more interesting we uh, noticed. Uh, in a rocky uh, habitat, uh, individuals were foraging separately, but in sandy habitat, the several individuals were poking their bills into the sandy floor more or less together. So it may be the case that, that they uh, can have a better foraging activities if they did it together in a group for a sandy habitat. And we also got the uh, motion films. Uh, a, a team from uh, National Geographic of the United States invented an underwater camera, and this is a bit big, so it could be employed only on a bigger animal like a, a turtle. And a turtle like this was uh, placed upon uh, the turtle. And uh, I am now based in Iwate Prefecture, shown in the red spot. Uh, and uh, this shows uh, the nesting grounds of the turtles. And nesting grounds of the turtles are usually located in the southern part of uh, uh, Japan. But as a matter of fact, uh, the turtles uh, visit a northern part of Japan, like Iwate Prefecture, where I work and live right now. Uh, and so we placed a data logger uh, on uh, the a turtle, and this uh, device could be uh, disconnected from the turtle automatically, and then we can uh, get the data and an analyze. Uh, the turtle uh, does a dive bout several times, but at the same time, it moves horizontally. Uh, this is uh, the uh, videotape captured from uh, the video. Uh, this is how the turtle sees uh, the underwater. Uh, this turtle just uh, took a breath. It's true that the turtle um, uh, have uh, several uh, dive bouts, but when it comes up to the water surface for taking a breath, uh, for some reason uh, he uh, rotates. Perhaps uh, the turtle does this kind of a rotation once it gets up to the surface of the water in order to take his uh, bearings. Uh, another uh, footage, something very interesting take place. Uh, you will see something uh, approaching. A turtle is uh, moving uh, toward this thing. What do you think this is? Uh, this is a jellyfish. And so the turtle uh, moves straight forward uh, to capture the jellyfish. And it swallows it down like this. Uh, the logo had the turtle um, uh, feeds on jellyfish, and that was a very interesting and important finding for the ecology of uh, the turtles. When we studied the feces of such turtles, we found such many shoals of benthos, and from this, uh, we thought that the, the, uh, the logo head turtles um, uh, tend to feed on uh, benthos, but now we can see that they also eat jellyfish besides benthos. And also, this is a plastic uh, uh, cap of a uh, detergent bottle. And it has been widely reported that uh, the uh, those uh, plastic bags uh, were eaten by uh, the uh, turtles, and uh, as a result, uh, they were killed, and uh, their populations are declining. Uh, that is the uh, widespread uh, uh, rumor and the conventional wisdom. But see this uh, uh, film. Something is approaching once again. This may look like a jellyfish, but actually this is a vinyl bag from a supermarket store. And the turtle approaches to this straightforward. But uh, it didn't eat it. We thought that it would eat it, certainly, but it didn't. And so sometimes we do find uh, the plastic bags or plastic bottles uh, from the feces of the turtle, but it's the things uh, perhaps it's not so simple that uh, eating up the plastic bags are killing the turtle. Uh, the story perhaps is not that simple. Uh, what I'm trying to pursue, pursue is the environmental sciences uh, through the lens of wildlife. Now the earth, and 70% of the earth is covered by ocean. Uh, 
humankind use various techniques to do a research on the ocean, but what we can do right directly to understand the marine environment is quite limited. Uh, perhaps the aquatic animals uh, know uh, much more about the ocean than we do. So what I would like to pursue is uh, the environmental sciences, especially to know more about the aquatic environment through the lens of wildlife. Environmental science is unique and different from other disciplines of natural sciences. In the case of uh, conventional natural sciences, scientific discovery made by a scientist, uh, but such findings usually are not so understandable by the citizens in general. Uh, but once such scientific findings were applied in the form of a new product or new policies that will benefit the general public, but usually the flow is a uh, one way from scientists uh, to the general citizens. But for the field of environmental science, the thing is not uh, like that. Uh, usually, uh, for environmental question, uh, the scientists uh, have to come up with the findings, and that need to be translated into a new product or new policies, even if the root causes for certain phenomena uh, is not so clear. Uh, and uh, what is beneficial for an environmental science is that uh, the uh, visual images are able to convey to the general public in a more easy to understand, understand manner based upon uh, the scientific findings. And I believe that that is uh, the interesting feature of uh, environmental sciences, where there should be more interaction between the scientists and the general citizens. And uh, uh, there was a academic uh, film contest, and this was not able to get any prize, but I'd like to show you some uh, uh, film footage. Uh, uh, this shows uh, uh, what are the kind of uh, geographical regions we do our studies. Uh, this is a sub-Arctic um, region. Uh, this is a southern elephant seal from Iceland. A killer whale, we employed a data logger uh, to illustrate the uh, uh, killer whale uh, ecology. And this is in a, 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 a northern um, elephant eel. And uh, this is uh, for a European shack uh, with a data logger on the abdomen and also on the back. And this is a, a, the river Ganges in Hawaii. Um, uh, shark, hammerhead shark. And Japan in Iwate Prefecture. Uh, this is a mola mola or sunfish. And loggerhead turtle uh, from Iwate Prefecture. Um, the loggerhead turtles do visit the northern part of Japan uh, as this place is a good fishing ground. This is where I am usually. Uh, this is where our center is uh, located. A lot of uh, water tanks and they are all filled with a, a loggerhead turtles and also green turtles. Uh, this is the loggerhead turtle. Uh, this is my lab and my students. Earlier, I mentioned that uh, the uh, turtle uh, uh, chose not to eat a vinyl bag, and uh, this is an experiment we try to see uh, when, on what conditions, uh, a turtle would try to eat a vinyl bag. But this uh, turtle, uh, in this uh, particular condition, didn't show any interest in a vinyl bag. This is in Kobe port. Uh, we provided uh, artificial uh, flipper uh, for a turtle who lost one of the uh, flippers. Uh, those are the cameras for accelerometers, and they are uh, driven by batteries. Uh, 
Uh, this is a fishing boat with a set net. We got a cooperation from the fisherman and we uh, attached date loggers. And automatically, the loggers are disconnected from uh, the animals. Uh, then we would collect them and connect the data logger uh, to the personal computer for uh, data downloading. And so uh, the graduate students are happy because they were able to uh, get good data. This is me. Uh, underwater, there are so many enigmas uh, whose answers are waiting uh, to be resolved. Uh, we are using high technology uh, to know more about the ecology of uh, the animals uh, under the water. Let's go to the best journey in the world with the use of high-tech data loggers. Uh, this is a track uh, we were able to uh, purchase with the fund from uh, National Geographic. Uh, I am uh, uh, together with the turtles. We are going to release those uh, turtles. Uh, we are always looking for the staff. Uh, uh, the solar phones are uh, out of reach in our area. Very little reward, uh, no assurance for a job opportunities, but when you are successful in a project, you can get an uh, intellectual reward, and that is the, the sales speech I always used in order to get the talented young people. Uh, this is a map of our field work sites, uh, fish, uh, birds, mammals, all kinds. Uh, and uh, we are thus trying to pursue uh, the science of environment 